Well, otherwise I'll go all Pentecostal on you. Actually, I couldn't if I tried. <laughs> Much as I'd like to imitate Kelly, I can't pull that off. And so I'll just have to be me. Did you uh, watch any of those uh, town hall meetings this last week that uh, Justin Trudeau was uh, running? You didn't. It's too bad, because uh, if you would have uh, seen that, you would have uh, had a bit of a context for the passage we're going to be looking at this morning. So... Uh, no, we can't run the clip. Uh, um, but uh, it was uh, one of those things. I admire the guy for doing it. Uh, like having the guts to just go out there in one of those bear pit sessions and let people throw questions at him and, uh, and respond to it. And uh, I don't think we learned anything that we hadn't heard before, but I admire him for doing it. There were some people there that had some legitimate questions that they wanted some answers to. There was others there that just wanted to embarrass him. And... Uh, and that's what reminds me of this passage in Mark chapter 12 that we want to look at. Uh, here's the comparison to uh, uh, where Jesus comes in. This ta uh, story takes place just a few days before Jesus was arrested and, uh, and then crucified. And uh, the uh, religious leaders of his day are becoming very concerned because Jesus' popularity is uh, growing like crazy. And they are afraid that they're going to lose their authority over the people and their jobs. And so they come at him with a whole lot of questions. There's, first of all, the Pharisees come at him, and then another religious group, the Sadducees, come at him. And uh, we're going to pick it up um, in verse 28 with uh, a third group. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. This morning, I want to look at the first part of Jesus' answer. He said that we are to love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind and with all of our strength. So we are to love God with our passions, our hungers, our perceptions and thoughts. But we are also to love him with how we talk and what we do with our hands, and how we utilize our talents, and how we react to challenges, our entire being is to display that we love God. There are to be no divided affections. And in Scripture, loving God is equated to keeping His commandments. And I'm going to use the words obeying God, obeying Jesus interchangeably, because in Scripture, uh, Jesus is God. Here's one of the things Jesus said. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. And then he went on to say, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Loving God with all of our hearts is the most important commandment. But loving God is not a state of mind where we feel nice about God. Loving God is the same as doing what God wills. There is no such thing as loving God while at the same time doing what I want to do. There is no such thing as I have faith, but I'm not faithful to God. Faith is not a state of mind. Faith in God and his word equals being faithful to God 
and his word. And when we love God, we are responding to the love that he has shown us. 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. And our love for God is primarily a response to the incomparable love that God has shown us through his son Jesus. And when Jesus died on a Roman cross, paying the penalty for our sins, there was literally nothing more that he could give us. There is no greater love than a person laying down their life for their friends. So the intellectual, the emotional, the volitional, and the physical elements of personhood are all combined in this love for God. It's an intelligent love. It's an emotional love. It's a willing love. And it is an active love. It's an all-consuming love. We do what God wants, not because... We have to, but because we want to. But sometimes we don't want to obey God, but begrudgingly do it anyway, because we know that in the end, it's the best thing for us. So how do we grow in our desire to do what God wants us to do so that we love him willingly, not grudgingly? There are different avenues that fuel our love for God and our worship of God. At the back of the church, we have some little booklets called Our Daily Bread. Uh, they come out with these every month or two, uh, a new one. And Man, I don't know how many years they've been doing that. I grew up on that booklet. Every morning at breakfast, my mom would read it. Before we get on the school bus, we had to read this thing. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and so I, I learned an awful lot of the Bible just through that, because, man, you get like five minutes every day, it, it kind of adds up. And... Uh, uh, but then when I went off to university, a friend asked me if I'd like to uh, get together with him uh, the next day and read the Bible with him. And I said, sure. And he said, okay, I'll see you at 7 o'clock. And I had heard of 7 a.m. And, uh, uh, and the next morning I experienced it. And so we got together and, and we uh, read the Bible and prayed together. And I was so impressed with uh, how he did that that I began doing it. And... Uh, uh, and every morning I would uh, get my Bible and, uh, you know, and over breakfast I would, you know, have my cereal and, and I'd read the Bible. And when we find something that uh, helps us grow in our relationship with God, we think that it's for the whole world and try to impose that on everybody else. Um, and I had some friends and some bought in and some didn't. Um, because God has wired us all differently. And so... The way that we respond to God, the way that we love God, the way that we worship God is a little bit different for each of us. And uh, so, like this morning's worship service here, um, some of you really get excited about the singing. Uh, and uh, like when you're singing, you know, you're totally focused on the word. You may have your eyes closed, you're worshiping God, you're oblivious to people around you. And that's wonderful. And others of you kind of just, you know, are here. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then, but, but you really like the Bible and you like teaching from the Bible. And that's the part of the service that excites you. And others, you can't wait till we get to communion. You're kind of tolerating the rest till we get here. And, and others of you are looking forward to when the whole thing is over. We've said amen. And then you get to visit with your friends. It's cool. Uh, that, that's, God just set us up differently. And, uh, and I'm glad we've got such variety here. Uh, so, you know, uh, just however God has made you uh, to respond to him, uh, go for it. So uh, this morning I want to walk through some of the different ways that people respond to God. And, and part of this is, uh, or a big part of it, is because I read a book this last week called Sacred Pathways, just in preparation for this morning. And, uh, and I won't go through all the things he does because uh, I'm somewhat limited to time, so that's why I'm talking so fast. And, uh, but I do want to get you know, a few of them in. But whatever nurtures your relationship with God and fuels for your love for God is what we need to respond to. And the first of these is loving God with solitude and silence. Psalm 5.3 says, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. 
when uh, Chris and I got back for, from our honeymoon, she asked me if I expected her to uh, um, get breakfast uh, for me in the morning. And uh, I thought it was an interesting request. And I said, no, you're just getting away. Um, <laughs> because my morning routine was to have a bowl of cereal. And uh, I did have some variation. And it wasn't Cheerios every Sunday or every day. Uh, and then, you know, I have my Bible there. And I would read it. And I would have breakfast and maybe a glass of juice. And then later years, when I got a little older, I had some coffee. Um, but uh, that worked for me. That you know, those times of uh, quiet in the morning, uh, and it was great until the kids came along and messed it all up. Um, uh, and I had to learn how to have a quiet time all over again. Uh, but Psalm 36, verse 6, goes not in the morning, but it says, On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Chris has her Bible reading in the evening. Uh, that doesn't work for me. I'm asleep. Uh, you know, just kind of like, and so, yeah, which is really interesting in our relationship because we can't have a serious discussion after nine o'clock. She wins every time because I, you know, so anyway, that's really beside the point. Okay, so loving God through solitude and silence, I'm really leaning far more here than you uh, probably want to know. Next one is loving God uh, outdoors. Um, maybe you've heard this story about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson deciding to go on a camping trip. And uh, uh, after dinner and a bottle of wine, they, uh, they uh, lay down for the night and go to sleep. And uh, some hours later, Holmes uh, wakes up and he nudges uh, Dr. Watson. And uh, he says, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. And Watson replies, I see millions of stars. And he says, well, what does that tell you? So he pondered for a moment and he said, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Or logically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, we will, I suspect we will have a good day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Holmes? And Holmes was silent for more. Then he said, Watson, someone has stolen our tent. Appreciate those of you who are smiling politely, you've heard it before. Uh, but they were probably not there to worship God. Uh, Psalm 19, King David of Israel wrote, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Some people feel the presence of God in a very unique way when they're out in nature. Surrounded by what God has created. And in my time here as a pastor, I would regularly take Monday off and often I would go out to a woodlot that we own a couple hours drive away. And I would spend the day out there uh, cutting firewood or not. Uh, and uh, just being around what God has made. All these different species of trees and, you know, and wild fruit and so on. And, uh, and, and my favorite spot is uh, a cedar grove where the uh, canopy is so dense that the sunlight doesn't penetrate to the ground. There's no grass growing there. But the earth is soft from decades uh, and perhaps hundreds of years of needles falling to the ground. And, and it's quiet apart from the birds singing and the uh, chatter of the squirrels. That's like a cathedral. Man, there's something about that that renews my spirit. That, you know, and I'd come back and I might be physically tired from the work, but being emotionally and mentally and spiritually refreshed. We can worship God outdoors. Then uh, another one is loving God by loving others. The link between loving God and loving others is very strong in the Bible. 1 John 5, 2 and 3 says, We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. In Hebrews 6, 10, it says, For God is not unjust. 
He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. He said, we show our love for God by caring for other believers. And for caregivers, this is not a chore. It's a form of worship. Mother Teresa would ask her pr prospective recruits, do you work, do, does your work give you joy? And if the answer was no, they did not make it in. I've been on the receiving end of so many of you loving God by helping me. If you'd rather go and help somebody than read a book on theology, this may be your favorite mode of worship. Loving God by loving others. Next one is uh, loving God through adoration. Psalm 7, uh, 17 says, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. And the idea is carried through into the New Testament. In Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through, get this, psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. I love the songs that we sing. I love the theology in them. The melody is great, too. Uh, but the words are just terrific. Some people here really appreciate a worship songs. You see them lifting their hands in worship, and others you look around for, what's that about, right? I don't feel any need to do that. But if that's your mode of worship, man, go for it. Uh, I love to see that. But if you don't raise your hands, don't feel as though your worship is inferior. It's got nothing to do with it. Uh, either way is perfectly acceptable to God. And for the people whose favorite way of expressing love to God is through adoration, probably have their car radio turned to 95.1, a Christian radio station. If you'd rather buy a music CD than a book on theology, this may be your way to worship. Some of you never bought a book on theology. Well, that's okay. There's some in the library. Uh, okay, the, uh, next one, uh, and this is the last one, um, is loving God with the mind. If you'd rather buy a theology book than a music CD, then this may be uh, yours. In John 5.39, Jesus commended the Jewish leaders for their study of the scriptures. He said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Psalm 119.15 says, I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. It's really fun to, to watch people in here uh, in the Sunday school class that uh, Ed leads. Uh, they love to get new insight into what went on in Jesus' day and in Bible times. And, uh, and that's great. Uh, I regularly go to uh, YouTube to uh, listen to guys like uh, Ravi Zacharias or, or Tim Keller and others because... I love the way that uh, they can take the Christian faith and articulate it to people who have never read the Bible. And they interact with people who have totally different views, but they do it in such a loving and respectful way. And I admire how they do it because that is how Scripture says we are supposed to interact with those who don't yet believe. So you can use all of these ways, and there's others, but I don't have time to go in and talk to me later, and I'll, I'll give you some more of them. But there is things that should feed our love for God, and there may be two or three that may be the most significant for you, but enjoy them all. And if you're stuck in a bit of a rut in your relationship with God and things are getting just to be a little bit too much routine, then let me encourage you to try one or the others. It may be that God will use that. God wants us to grow in our love for him, not in an infatuation kind of a love, but a love that is expressed through our commitment to him. And whatever avenue helps you to worship God is something you can focus on without neglecting the others.